let's make an account of that. When I, was, when I started uh, doing research into the neighborhood of the GE Realty plot, there are many people who lived there over the last 120 years, many scientists, many related to GE, obviously. And I started coming across this gentleman who just lived up the street from me many years ago by the name of John C. Fisher. And when I was finding him in the newspaper, he's always referred to as the president of the American Museum of Electricity. And as I'm looking more and more at these articles about him and about this monstrosity of a, of a museum that's proposed, I get really curious about it. And I try to find more information about it in other places. And there really isn't any. So how is this proposed 140-acre museum and everything else just unknown? So that's the genesis of why I started uh, taking a look into this museum, this proposed museum. And I have to apologize, I haven't had a chance to really memorize this. I had another presentation on baseball and connected to the earlier in the week, which refocused my ideas. So anyway, a trolley car ride along a stretch of riverfront track, a stroll through a diesel electric submarine, a ride across a river on a cableway, a guided tour of an antiquated 1920-style hydro powerhouse, a chance to see educational television in action, a first hand or first ear, listen to a conversation between astronauts in space. A look at the records of the earliest electrical companies. A close up view of computers at work. So reads the opening statement from the 1964 brochure for the American Museum of Electricity. So, where was this magical place? Was it going to be in a great city like New York City? Maybe Los Angeles or Chicago? No. It was going to be in Miskeuna, New York, on a 140-acre campus along the Mohawk River at Lock 7. Plans for the museum began in 1959 as a wing of the proposed Schenectady Museum. It quickly outgrew the Schenectady Museum and took, its on, took on its own life as the American Museum of Electricity. And from there, it outgrew any sense of reality. <laughs> Unfortunately, you can't really see this, but I'll just read through what, is, what was planned for this 140-acre campus. The, mu the museum itself, which would house and display exhibits from the electric age, a complete television studio to be used by WMHT, a radio planetarium, a computer center, and remember, this is the 1960s, so a computer center would have been enormous, buildings devoted to electrical power in the home, transportation and defense, power generation and communications, Electric, the Electric Industry Hall of Fame, a huge plexiglass dome that would enclose the Children's Museum and Playground, a research library and archives, a natural amphitheater for concerts and lectures, a hydroelectric power station, dam, barge, canal, and lock were all existing structures on the site, so they would be integrated into the museum. <coughs> Cable cars crossing to the other side of the Mohawk River, a working railroad spur line to allow visitors to ride in old trolley cars pulled by ancient locomotives. And yes, a retired diesel and electric submarine in a newly built marina. Now, the plan was bold. <laughs> Dare anyone say. The buildings would not be built at one, a time, one, one at a time allowing the museum to open and develop as funding would allow. No, this plan was bold. They would build it all at the same time, in just two and a half years. The budget for the, to build the museum was set at $15 million, which is $120 million in our money today. The first $200,000 would be raised from local businesses in 1963 to pay for the early necessities, including the acquisition of land, the purchase of collections of historic electrical equipment, preliminary architectural and economic studies, and the hiring of a director and small staff to prepare for the national phase of the project. Then from 1964 to 1966, the next $14.8 million would be raised from federal grants, large companies, societies, and endowments. 
Groundbreaking would begin in 1964 and finish in 1966. Tickets for the museum, when it was finished, were to be set at $4, which is $32 in money today. Expectations were that one million visitors in the first year would visit the museum complex, which would employ 100 people. The prestigious architectural consulting firm of Latham, Tyler, and Jensen Designs of Chicago and Copenhagen was commissioned to prepare the, the, international, the initial site development plan and the preliminary architectural model. Now here's a rough drawing of what this whole thing would look like. My analog laser pointer. Here's your submarine. Here's the actual museum. Here's the Hall of Fame. Here's the computer building, the library and archives, um, the planetarium, the WMHT building, the cultural center, the Spur Railroad is here. You get the point. <coughs> Now, to come up with a plan this daring, this bold, you need really intelligent people. And in this case, I really mean really intelligent people. You have John C. Fisher, who is to be the president of this. He is a physicist at the GE Research Laboratory. J. Herbert Holloman is the vice president of the organization, and he's the general manager of the GE Research Laboratory. Mylon D. Fisk, the secretary of the organization, is a physicist at the GE Research Laboratory. And Thomas Payne, the treasurer, is the manager of the GE Engineering Laboratory. And they're able to put together a stellar list of scientists, inventors, politicians, and business leaders to be on their board. Now, I'm just going to call attention to a few of them. There's Governor Nelson Rockefeller. There's Detlef Bronk, who's the president of the National Academy of Sciences, and William B. Shockley, director of the Shockley, Tran the Shockley Transistor Company, and a 1956 Nobel Prize winner in physics, the co-inventor of the transistor. The material on display at the museum would, be, would include many items from the 1964 World's Fair, many electrical items of historical value from local private collections, and in 1964, the big stuff starts rolling. Aberfoyle Manufacturing Company donated Black Maria, a 35-ton locomotive built at the Lynn River Works of General Electric, built in 1894. Locomotive 100 also comes in. This was the first electric motive, the locomotive used by the New York Central Line, and it had been made by, in, in combination between Alco and General Electric. Now, both locomotives were to be working exhibits, bringing passengers to and, to and fro along the railroad spur line in old trolley cars. Now, by, by March 1964, they actually raised that first tranche of $200,000, and it comes from local money. Now, they hoped to get that all by the end of 1963, but it was only three months later, so they're following along the timeline. But that's where things begin to fall apart. In late 1963, J. Herbert Holland was tapped by the Kennedy administration to be the Assistant Secretary for Commerce, covering science and technology. He served in this position through 1967. When he left, he became the president of the University of Oklahoma. At the same time, GE transfers Thomas Paine to Santa Barbara, California, to manage the new Technical Military Planning Operation, or TEMPO project. Paine would stay with this project until 1968, when he became the Deputy Administrator of NASA. Before the year was out, he would become NASA's full time full administrator, overseeing the moon landing in 1969. In 1964, John Fisher transfers from Santa Barbara to work on the TEMPO project, then moves to Washington, D.C. in 1968, where he becomes the chief scientist for the United States Air Force. With three of the four driving forces behind the museum off to pursue other projects, the, a the AME languishes. Fundraising goals fall off the map. In fact, there's no record of the museum receiving any significant contributions after 1964. But the museum itself continued. They continue to accept electrical devices with historic value. They continue hiring staff. 
and in general went about the day-to-day -day management of a non-existent museum. <laughs> By 1970, the dream dies and the project collapses. In 1872, the American Museum of Electricity begins to give away or sell off its collection. Uh, this is a picture of John Fisher and Millen Fisk looking at the model that had been made by uh, Jensen and, and Associates. So, oh, no ground in the, in the end of this whole, throughout, the, throughout this whole thing, no ground has ever been broken and no submarine has ever made its way to this era. <laughs> Black Mariah goes to the Connecticut Trolley Museum where it sits today rusting. Locomotive 100 was given to the Altamont Fairgrounds. Today it just sits rusting and vandalized on an abandoned rail spur near the landmark. But much of the collection, which would have been lost otherwise, has been saved. Portions went to the Smithsonian Institution, the New York State Museum, and to my side. In fact, here are three items that were, that were saved that were part of the collection. The very lower end there, there's an old art brush um, generator, a voltmeter, and a early um, TV camera from WRGB with Chris Hunter of my side standing in front of her. The 180, the 140 acres were eventually sold off to the town of Neskina to be kept as a wild area with the Mohawk Hudson bike path running through it. But this kind of thing always makes me wonder, what would have happened if it had really been built? In, 1960, in January of 1966, the American Museum of Electricity commissioned a study by the Economic Development Administration to better understand the effect it would have on the local region. And I'll give you their projections, but as with any of these kind of protections, you need to take them with a mouthful of salt. <laughs> 850,000 tourists could be expected to visit the museum during its first year of full operation in 1971. Personally, let me get a little more water. Personal income in the area would be increased by $78 million, and million by 1997. And about 36 million tourists would spend $74 million for goods and services. Local taxes would generate an additional $2.4 million for a total economic impact of $155 million. Jobs in the museum and related service industries would increase to 980 during that same 26 year period. So what happens to the town of Niskayuna? A sleepy suburban town with a population of just over 14,000 when the museum was planned, and just 26,000 now. How would it have handled an influx of nearly one million visitors a year? Now, the quiet community would have needed to change completely. It would have had to overhaul its structures, hardening existing roads, Ball Town Road would have, would have to have gone from a two-lane highway to at least four, all the way out to the Northway in Clifton Park. And then there's also River Road and Rosendale Road. And if you've ever been down those two, they're very curvy, tiny little roads. And those were the ones that were, were deemed to be the direction for traffic to take to get there. <laughs> And one can assume new restaurants, hotels, and other services would have, would have had to have been built since they were never part of the museum plan to begin with. And what of my city's Schenectady? Wouldn't that $155 million coming into the, into the county have really helped at a time when the city was going dark with the loss of Elko and the layoffs in Thank you very much. <laughs>